Okay, welcome again to day two of Freak Nick. Uh, we've already had uh, the uh, Mark Spencer talk earlier on asterisk, and uh, this is the second of our third what we're calling how-to workshops. Uh, yesterday we had the uh, how to do your own hardware, and uh, this morning we've got uh, Wolfus talking about how to uh, get the most out of your Xbox, and then uh, later on this afternoon we'll have uh, Tillman Lesher uh, talking about how to develop asterisk applications. So with that, I'll hand it over to Wolfus. Hello, welcome to Freak Nick. As you said, uh, my name is Wolfus, or you can call me Brian. A lot of people call me Brian. Um, I'd like to start off with just a little bit of legal disclaimer. Um, we are talking about modifying the Xbox. Microsoft probably doesn't want you to do that. They claim it's illegal. I don't do illegal things. I don't modify Xboxes. I've never done any of this. I did stay in a day's in last night, though, so I think I can make it through all this. Anyhow, with that being said, no, really, I have done a lot of these. Um, at first, I was real skeptical about giving this talk, bringing modified Xboxes in. And then I said, well, screw it. If I get arrested, at least I'll be famous, you know? So that's, for, that's the legal disclaimer. That's out of the way. Um, I'd like to start off really talking about the history of Xbox modifications. It's came a long way since the first Xbox came out. Um, back in the day when the Xbox came out, if you wanted to modify an Xbox, it required you to solder 29 wires onto the motherboard of the Xbox. These motherboards, the traces and the solder points on these are very small. As you can see, we're having problems because we need to zoom in so close to the Xbox motherboard. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get some good pictures, but I've got a lot of samples here to show you. Afterwards, you can come up here, take a look at it if you have any questions. I can show you the points again if you can't see them on this screen. Also, I'd like to ask that if you could keep your questions until the end because I have a lot of information to cover. Uh, we'll have a question and answer session at the end. We've got another microphone here we can use. Um, we're going to go from the beginning from a newbie standpoint, somebody that's never looked inside of an Xbox, has no idea what the advantages of modifying an Xbox are, uh, and talk about the different ways that you can modify an Xbox. Hopefully when I'm done, all of you should be able to modify an Xbox using the procedure that I'm talking about. There's basically four ways you can modify an Xbox. I'm going to go into great detail on one of them. That's the preferred method that I use. You've probably heard about mod chips. I have a mod chip here to demonstrate, but that's not the method that I'm going to talk about. The first method is called a cheap mod. Cheap mod is exactly what it says. It's cheap. You take a small BIOS chip and you take the socket that it goes in, you solder some wires to it, and you put it on an L LPC point on the motherboard. This area right here where I have a pin header that's soldered in is what I refer to as the LPC. I'll be able to show you better on one that doesn't have a pin header in it. Um, cheap mods will cost you about 10 bucks, and you can modify your Xbox. Now, there's a lot of soldering that's required to do a cheap mod. That's why I don't prefer to do it. Um, you have to solder to the socket for the BIOS and to the motherboard, so it can take some time. And if you're not real good with soldering, it's probably not a method that you should choose. The next method, which is very popular, is to use a mod chip. Mod chips usually run anywhere from $35 to $85. Um, they're easily accessible. You can get one in a couple days. Um, there's lots of different vendors of mod chips. Um, there isn't a lot of advantages to a mod chip. Now, you can easily mess up your Xbox doing any method of modification. If you do a cheap mod, you can mess it up. You can render it unusable. Um, you can do the same thing with a mod chip. Um, but usually with a mod chip, you can always rescue yourself. The, uh, the Most of the methods, well, all the methods except for the cheap mod and the mod chip itself, um, or we're going to acquire some form of modification to the Xbox BIOS. If you screw up the Xbox BIOS, you will have to use a mod chip. There's not really any way around it. Um, we'll get more into mod chips later. The method that I'm going to go into detail in is called flashing the TSOP or flashing the onboard BIOS. Okay? There's a little risk involved because, like I said, if you screw up the onboard BIOS, then you will have to get a mod chip. But it's an easy way to do it. It's a fast way to do it. There's very little soldering that's required. 
And if you do screw up, you do have a backup plan where you can put a mod chip in it. The last method for modifying an Xbox is a software exploit. Um, initially, when the Xbox came out, everybody said that you know there's not going to be any way to hack an Xbox without opening it up, without doing some soldering, without um, messing with the Xbox BIOS. Well, it didn't take long, and somebody found a couple of exploits that would allow you to modify your Xbox without doing soldering. Um, they call these soft mods or, or software exploits. Basically what they do is they exploit either the audio files. Um, anybody that has an Xbox knows that you can transfer your own music onto the Xbox and play that music in games. Well, you can create a file that appears to the Xbox to be a music file, a valid music file, and it's actually an exploit. There's also another exploit for fonts, the fonts that are on the dashboard, which is a screen that comes up when you turn on the Xbox. I'm not going to cover those in great detail. That's not my preferred way of doing the Xbox. I've seen a lot of people screw up. The uh, Xbox is doing soft mods. Uh, there are problems with the, the clock timer on them. It can go into a clock loop. Question? Um, there's lots of issues that go on with the soft mods. Um, there's been fixes that come out. It's still kind of early as far as the soft mods go to get all the bugs worked out of it. Um, and that's really why I don't prefer it. I look at it from a standpoint of if you're going to modify somebody else's Xbox, then you want to give them something that's pretty reliable and you don't want to screw their hardware up and have them go buy another Xbox. So that's why I choose the TSOP Flash. Um, let's talk a little bit about the hardware itself. These Xboxes are cheap. They break. They have really inferior components in them. The DVD drives go bad. The power supplies go bad. They have lots of issues with heat. But from what I understand, Microsoft doesn't make any money on these things, so I can understand why they wouldn't make them really good. Um, actually, an Xbox is worth more in pieces than it is whole. If you guys want to make good money, make a good living, buy a new Xbox, take it apart, and sell the parts on eBay. Um, you'll have more than enough to buy another Xbox, especially if you get lucky and get one with a Samsung DVD drive in it. We'll talk about the DVD drives later on. Um, the hardware, it, it is really inferior. You can mess it up real easy. Uh, all these boards that I've got up here are bad, uh, bad from a standpoint of you could get them back up and running if you put a mod chip on them. The BIOS on these boards is shot, and it won't boot up. Um, they do have issues with heat. Um, a lot of people put other fans on them. When you start putting 7,200 RPM drives in them, you can generate a lot of heat, and that can cause problems with the Xbox. Um, we'll also get more into that later when we talk about hard drives. There are seven versions of the Xbox out right now. Um, they don't tell us when they're releasing another version. They don't have a nice sticker on the bottom that says version 7 or anything like that. Basically, you just have to find out that it's different from the previous versions of Xbox. There may be things that you can actually see on it that look different than there might not. Um, why is it important to know which version of Xbox that you have? Well, if you're going to use a mod chip, it's, it's pretty important to know which version of Xbox you have. Um, uh, uh, mod chips can be version specific. Um, one thing, one rule of thumb is the older the Xbox, the better. Microsoft's continually trying to come out with new ways to prevent people from modifying their Xboxes, and they're not really good at it, but they make it a little more difficult until we can figure out ways to get around that. So just a good rule of thumb, there is a date stickered on the bottom. If you want to get an Xbox, I usually tell everybody, just go buy a used one. You'll save a few dollars. Microsoft doesn't get that money. You know, whoever you're buying the Xbox from does. Um, and you'll end up with an Xbox that's probably pretty modifiable. We'll talk about right now the, the ways to determine what type of Xbox, what version Xbox you have. Can everybody, can everybody see this pretty good? Can you see that there's a fan that's on one of the heat sinks? That's the graphics processor heat sink, and it has a fan on it. If you have a fan on your Xbox, it's a version 1.0. Plain and simple. Real easy to tell. Open the cover, see a fan, you've got a 1.0. The Xboxes 
um, have another video chip on them, and we use that to identify the Xboxes. The 1.0 and 1.1 use a chip that is a connextant, C-O-N-E-X-A-N-T. So if you open up your Xbox and you see a fan and it has a connextant chip, it's a 1.0. If you don't see a fan and it has a connextant chip, it's a 1.1. 1.0s and 1.1s are pretty easy to identify. They also have 1 meg BIOS chips on them. That's the BIOS chip on the board. The 1 meg BIOS chip is wider than the 256K chip that they're now using, so it's easy to identify. Um, 1.0s and 1.1s have a 1 meg BIOS. We're going to talk about the benefits of a 1 meg BIOS in a little while. Um, so that's the way to tell a 1.0 and a 1.1. 1 1.2s and 1.3s are a little more difficult to tell apart from the t between the two, but it's not really important to know whether you have a 1.2 or 1.3 because essentially they're pretty much the same. They have a 256K chip on it, so if you look in there and you see you don't have a fan, um, and you have a 256K chip, you can rule out 1.0 and 1.1 right away. Also, it doesn't use the connextant chip. Oh, I won't even bother showing you this one. It's in a case. It uses a chip that's called Focus. So if you open up your box, you don't have a fan, you have a Focus chip, you know it's not a 1.0, it's not a 1.1, it's either a 1.2 or 1.3. I wouldn't worry too much about figuring out which one it is. 1.4s um, and 1.5s. They are uh, also use a connextant chip, but they have a different, a different power connector on the board. It's easy to tell the difference. The older Xboxes have one strip of pins on the power connector, and the newer ones have two strips. It looks actually just like an ATX power supply connector. The 1.6 does not use a connextant chip or a focus chip, so if you don't have those two, you have a 1.6. It's that simple. 1.6 boxes are really hard to modify right now. Um, the mod chip makers are coming out with some things that you can use a mod chip for them. I think all the soft mod stuff works on the 1.6s. Uh, T-SOP flashing does not. And I don't believe cheap mods do either. Somebody may correct me on that. But um, best thing I can tell you is just get an older Xbox. Try to get a version 1.0 or 1.1 with a 1 meg, mo one meg BIOS on them. Um, the Xbox is basically like a stripped-down Windows 2000 kernel. Um, it's not real powerful as far as running applications goes. It does games well, but it doesn't really multitask. So you can't, say, play an Xbox game and FTP into your Xbox at the same time or serve up web pages and play an Xbox game at the same time. Uh, it doesn't do that. It does play games really well, and there's lots of good applications that you can run with it, but... Um, it's, it's pretty limited as far as how many things you can do at one time. Um, while we're on hardware, I'm going to talk about the differences of the DVD drive. And um, if you want to come up later, I can show you how to tell the difference between the DVD drives that you have without opening the cover. There are three different DVD drives. There are 5X DVD drive. Um, the manufacturers that make them are Thompson, Philips, and Samsung. And in that order is how well they're constructed. The Thompson drives are going to be the first ones to break. They have horrible lasers in them. Uh, they just don't last very long, and they're extremely slow. They'll practically only read DVD-Rs. Um, they don't do, or RWs, they don't do CDRs or CDRWs very well. Um, you can get inside of them and tweak the pots on them to get them to read discs better. But um, I just usually tell everybody, just try to get one with a Philips or a Samsung drive. If you're going to be modifying your Xbox, you're going to want to be able to read different types of media. So um, don't go with a Thompson drive. Philips are a little bit better. They'll read more media. Uh, Samsung's the way to go. You can get those drives off eBay between $80 and $100. Um, you can also modify a retail Samsung drive to go into the Xbox. The Xbox uses a proprietary power connector on them, and uh, you'd have to modify any retail DVD drive to work in the Xbox, but it is possible. Samsung's read practically every media you can throw at them, and their access times are a little bit better. 
um, hard drives. The Xbox ships with a 10 gig hard drive, of which you can only use 8 gigs of. Um, it's a 5400 RPM drive. There's nothing real fancy about it. Adding a 7200 RPM drive does not really gain you much. Uh, it gives you more heat. If you can get one, though, with an 8 meg cache, it does seem to um, the access times and it does load data a little faster. Um, if you're going to use a 7200 RPM drive, it's probably not a bad idea to add some extra fans to it. Um, opening the Xbox. On the bottom side of the Xbox, you'll see that there's two stickers, silver in color. There is a screw underneath each of those stickers. There's also four little rubber feet on the corners. You need to pull those rubber feet off, and there are screws under those. They use Torx screws. Does anybody here not know what Torx is? Okay. It's, it's like a star, basically. Um, you need a, a Torx 10 and a Torx 20 to get into an Xbox and do the modifications. That's really the only screwdrivers you need. It doesn't have regular screws in it. Um, some people are real fanatical about surgically removing those stickers so that in the event that you screw it up, you can return the b Xbox. Um, I don't. I just puncture right through them. I mean, Xboxes are pretty cheap. Um, if you screw one up, as I said before, you can always sell the parts on eBay. Uh, the motherboard's probably the only thing that's bad. Um, not only that, you could probably rescue the Xbox with a mod chip. So, if you want to surgically remove your stickers, a, a heat gun or a hair dryer, um, I hear is the trick to use. Um, but uh, just be careful because if, if they're wrinkled or the, the corners peel, you may have problems trying to return an Xbox that you've messed up. He said he worked in a repair center. He's got some information about this. Yeah, the uh, I worked. I, I'm from Memphis, and a company called Selectron repairs all the Xboxes. I was a senior level tech on the Xbox account. Um, first, with the with the labels, uh, they they look for that specifically on every machine that comes in. I, I don't doubt it. Yeah. So, and it's it's pretty easy to tell unless you spend a whole lot of time on it. There's always a diagonal crease. Always. Yeah, that's why I don't even bother with it. I just puncture through the sticker and take the screws out and and, and go on with it. But as uh, far as the DVD drives, that's what I really wanted to say. Mm -hmm. The um, If you lucked out with a machine with a Philips um, or a good or a Samsung, when if you sent it in for repair, unless it was either a problem unit where they had to replace three or four uh, parts in it, you're getting a Thompson when it comes back, always. I, I've noticed a, a lot of Thompsons come out of refurbished Xboxes. They do. A they lot do. of the new Xboxes, though, the newer ones, if you can get a 1.4 or 1.5, a lot of those had Samsung drives in them. So they they had a unit called a QT unit. Uh, uh, I missed getting asked this question. Where the con where the controllers plug in, the controller ports, the USB ports plug right. onto the main board, they were integrated. Does that affect modding it at all? No, it doesn't. Okay. It does not. Um, as he was saying, there, there's, uh, there's also two different styles of the way the controller ports plug onto the board. Um, early, mo early models had a basically like a daughter board that plugged into the, the motherboard. Um, now the cables just plug right into the motherboard. Um, there's not a lot of issues with it, but I've seen some people mess those boards up and break them, taking them out or putting them in. So um, it's definitely easier if you just have cables that plug into the board. Just be careful with them. They're real fragile. Um, you'll see people all the time needing Xbox ports. They'll buy the case just for the ports. Um, uh, thanks for that information. Yeah. No, no problem at all. Um, tools you're going to need. I've already told you that you're going to need a Torx 10 and a Torx 20. Um, I have these here. If anybody brought an Xbox and they want to mod it on their own after this talk is over, I will be available for assistance, questions, whatever you need. If you need to borrow any tools or anything like that, um, feel free to do so. Um, you will need two uh, Torx screwdrivers, um, a magnifying glass. It's extremely helpful. These things are really, really small. 
Um, the soldering that you're going to be doing is not a lot. You don't have to be a master at soldering. Basically, the method that I'm going to talk about, you put two little drops of solder on the board, and that's it. Um, but you do want to make sure that you don't get it on any other traces. Most people that mess up Xboxes lift traces off the motherboard. Um, that brings me to the next item that you're going to need, a soldering iron. Um, I don't know if anybody's, uh, anybody's seen on the website, but there is some uh, wrong information regarding a soldering iron that's posted on the website uh, about this talk. Um, I don't know if I made a mistake or if whoever put it on there made a mistake. It says 70 watts or less. I would use a 25-watt soldering iron. 70 watts is way too hot. If you get it, get it too hot and you leave it on there too long, you'll start lifting traces off the motherboard. That's when you really run into problems. If you lift a trace, chances are putting a mod chip in, it's not going to fix it. It's just uh, unless you can repair the trace and you're, and you're good at that, um, which if you screwed it up in the first place, you're probably not good at fixing traces. <laughs> um, so a, a soldering iron does come in handy. Now, there are other methods of doing this, and I've heard people do some really crazy things because they can't solder. Um, there are some other options. Uh, I lost my conductivity pen, but you can buy a pen that basically, when you write with it, it writes in conductive ink. And a little drop of conductive ink will work the same as a solder. Not only that, if you mess it up and you get too much on there, it's a lot easier to get off than solder. Um, which brings me to my next thing, uh, solder braid. If you're not good at soldering or you're just a dumbass, you might want to get some solder braid. Um, another method is called nickel print. This stuff's expensive. It comes in a pretty good-sized bottle, more than enough to do more than 1,000 Xboxes. You only need a little tiny drop of this stuff. It's basically just like a conductive paint. Uh, they use it for repairing uh, traces on motherboards or any circuit boards. Um, it was about 18 bucks for this bottle, but you can take a toothpick, stick it in the bottle, drop a little drop where you need to solder, and it's as good as done. Also, this stuff comes off a lot easier than solder. So if you really suck at soldering, you may want to go with a conduct conductivity pen or some nickel print. There are other methods. People use rear window defogger kits. Um, people also use aluminum foil. You could probably have one of your buddies take two butter knives and, you know, stick them in your Xbox while you boot it up and make conductivity between these two points. I wouldn't recommend that. If you screwed your Xbox up, it's not my fault. Um, but basically what we're going to be talking about is we got two points that we need to bridge, two little pads of solder that we need to make a, a connection across. However you do it, it's, it's, it's your choice. Um, I got to the point where I really kind of like this nickel print because before my soldering iron's even heated up, I can be done with nickel print. Just take a toothpick, drop it in there, put two little drops on the board, and I'm done. Uh, it dries real fast by the time I've got the case back together. Um, it's good. Another thing is, is with solder, sometimes it's hard to tell if you've got those two points actually bridged. Um, I've had cases where you do the solder, you put it back together, you try to flash the BIOS, and it doesn't flash because one of the points isn't all the way soldered. I haven't really ever had that problem with the nickel print or conductivity pens. As long as it's clean, take a little alcohol or something and clean the area, you should be able to get uh, conductivity between those two points. Um, any more tools? Tools, tools, what I got? Oh, if you're going to solder, you might want to use some. The thinner, the better. You don't need big, huge solder because all you're going to do is make a mess. You're going to get too much on the iron or whatever. And you just don't really need that much if you're going to be soldering. So you can get some really fine silver solder. It works out pretty good. Um, one last thing, these rubber feet that I was talking about on the bottom, when you peel them off, they don't stick back on really well. So I take just a little bit of silicone, put a little drop on those rubber feet when I'm putting them back together. So you might want to get some silicone. Um, that's about it for the tools. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is the, the TSOP mod. We're going to actually go through step by step. I'm not going to mod one here, but I'm going to cover every step. Um, some things that you're going to need to get before you can do a TSOP flash. The method that I use takes advantage of a bug in the game 007, Agent Under Fire. You can also get the platinum version which is the, that the Platinum Hits version, the one I have here, it also works. Um, 
the way it works, uh, also MechaSalt. MechaSalt also has the same bug in it. Basically, what you do is you create a game save, you put it on a memory card, you transfer that game save to the Xbox, and when you load that, it loads what it thinks is a game save, but it's not. It's basically a way to run unsigned code, and it boots up Linux, and you can use a program in Linux to flash the BIOS. Um, again, there's two points on the board. One of those points allows you to erase the BIOS, and another one allows you to write the BIOS. If you don't have both of those points, you're not going to be able to get a new BIOS on there. The program that flashes the BIOS will tell you that it can't flash the BIOS because one of your points is screwed up. So you'll have to take it apart again and redo your points. Um, another thing that you're going to want to have is definitely a memory card. Um, now you're probably wondering, well, if I need to get this game save on this memory card, how am I going to do that? Well, if you know somebody that has a modified Xbox, they can take the game save, put it on the memory card, you can use it, put it on your Xbox. If not, there's another method called the Mega X key, which you can hook to your computer, plug the memory card into it, transfer it from your computer to the memory card, memory card to the Xbox, and you'll be able to load that exploit. Um, if you don't have a Mega X key or you just can't afford one, um, you don't have anybody that has a modified Xbox, there is a third method that is uh, a little more difficult. I, I don't really like doing it. Uh, I've got, I've got a uh, memory card that has one on it. I keep it on it all the time. And that involves doing a hard drive swap. Um, what it is is basically you need to um, hook up the power to the hard drive in the Xbox and plug your computer into it, boot Linux. Right as the boot process comes up, you need to swap the cables and plug your Xbox cable back in. A lot of people, it takes several tries to get it done. It can be time consuming. Um, and I mean, really, you, you could mess something up. You know, when you're switching cables with uh, devices that are plugged in, then, you know, there is there is a potential for for messing something up. So, the best method for getting that game save hack onto a memory card is to get with somebody that has a modified Xbox, have them make a memory card for you, keep it, don't ever erase it, and you you can do as many Xboxes with it as you want. Now, earlier I talked about the BIOS. Your question. brought one. They're also free. You only have to pay for shipping. Um, what he was saying is, is there's a Fantasy Star online adapter that will plug into the um, into the Xbox controller and it has a USB port on it. Um, I didn't talk about this earlier, but the ports on the front of an Xbox are USB ports. They don't have the standard plug on them. It's a proprietary connector, but it's just a USB port. Um, so you can hook things like keyboards up to it and stuff like that if you're running Linux. Um, the only game really that supports the keyboard is uh, the Fantasy Star Online, which is a paid service game, I think. So now that we basically know that we need to have either 007 Agent Under Fire or Mech Assault, we need to have this memory card with this game save hack on it. Um, I'll tell you the usual places that you can get all these things, all the applications and all the, the exploits and everything like that. There's some good websites out there, some good FTP sites. Um, but we've got all our tools together. We've got the game. We've got our memory card ready to go. Uh, there's one other thing that you're going to want to have. Um, it's an auto-installer CD. This will save you lots of time transferring applications from your computer to your Xbox. It will prepare the hard drive for you. Um, we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. Um, but you're ready to go. You're ready to open your Xbox. Go ahead and take the screws out of the bottom. Remove the hard drive tray. It's, it's pretty simple. There's one screw in the center that you can take out, and it'll allow you to remove the hard drive tray. Two screws on the front of the DVD player. Um, remove the DVD player. And if you have a version 1.0 or 1.1 Xbox, you will need to remove the motherboard. Um, I told you earlier that Microsoft is constantly trying to come out with new ways to prevent people from modifying the Xbox, but as of version 1.2, 
they put both of the solder points on the top. And I said, great, I don't need to take out any more motherboards. Uh, I don't see how they made it any more difficult. They just made it easier. Um, but if you do have a 1.0 or 1.1 motherboard with the one meg BIOS, one solder point is on the top and the other one's on the bottom. Now I'm going to try to get a motherboard over here so I can show you where this point is. So give me just a moment to get this set up. I know it's hard to see. It's marked on the Xbox board as R7D3. There's two small pads of solder. And afterwards, if you want to come up and take a look at any of these, feel free to. I'll point them out to you. But the one on the top of the 1.0 and 1.1, actually the one on the top of all of them, um, one of them is R7D3. The other one on a 1.0 and a 1.1, you have to remove the motherboard. And I'm going to show you that one right now. This one's even harder to see. You'll probably need to come up and see this one. It's labeled R74. These two points will need to be soldered on a 1.0 or 1.1 Xbox. Once you soldered it and it's complete, go ahead and put it back in the Xbox. Now, this is the part that really sucks if you're bad at soldering. If you mess up the point that's on the bottom of the board, you've got to take it back out of the Xbox. Um, so that's another reason why if you're not really good at soldering, you may want to choose another option if you have 1.0 or 1.1 Xbox. Um, mount everything back in the Xbox, put the screws back in. You don't necessarily have to put all the screws in the motherboard if you think you might not have a good solder joint. Uh, you do need to put a few in, you know, for grounding purposes and whatnot. Um, put the DVD drive back in, put the hard drive back in. You don't necessarily have to put the screw back in the center because you're going to be taking that hard drive back out shortly. Um, once you have everything back together, go ahead and power up the Xbox. Cross your fingers and watch the green light around the power switch. If it comes on green and it puts up the little flubber screen for Microsoft and it makes sound, you're still good. Um, if it doesn't come on and it flashes red and green, start looking for a mod chip because you just messed something up. And hopefully you didn't lift a solder trace or something, a trace on the board, uh, and a mod chip will fix it. Um, that little flashing red and green is known as frag. So if you're looking and somebody says, I fragged my Xbox, it doesn't mean they took out the rail gun and blew their motherboard apart. It means it's flashing red and green. Um, flashing red and green is not a good sign, and it's not something you want to see when you just went out and bought a brand new Xbox, took it home, took it apart, put two dots of solder on it, and now you can't use your Xbox. Um, it happens to people. People have come to me that have fragged their motherboards um, to fix them. Um, so if you've got everything together and you've got it on the screen, go ahead, eject the tray, and put in the 007 Agent Under Fire CD or your Mech Assault CD, whichever one you're using. Um, don't push the tray back in yet because it'll start the game up, and that's not what you want to do at this point. You want to go into the Microsoft dashboard, go into memory, and transfer that file from the memory card to the hard drive. 
You can do this whole thing from the memory card, but I would copy it to the hard drive just to be on the safe side. Because if something screwed up and you disconnected your controller while it's reading that card, it may screw something up. So just to be safe, it only takes a few seconds, go ahead and transfer it over to the hard drive and load the game save from the hard drive. Uh, once you've got it on the Xbox, go ahead, push the tray in for the DVD drive, and it will start the game. Go into load game, find the game that you just saved to the Xbox, press the green button, and what's going to happen is, is the screen's going to go black, the light around the power button's going to go orange, you're going to hear some footsteps, somebody rewinding a record, and some opera music. Okay? You guys probably think I'm bullshitting you, but that's really going to happen, assuming you did everything right. Um, there's not any video driver. Nothing's going to display on the TV. It's not going to say, you know, welcome to Linux, show you cute little penguins or anything like that. It's just going to be black. All right? That's not a bad thing. Um, you will need to telnet into the box at this point in order to flash your BIOS, um, which... I need to go back a step because I didn't tell you that there's also a BIOS that needs to be put on the memory card with the game save exploit. Hopefully you did that when you got with your buddy and borrowed his. Um, if you're using a 1 meg BIOS on a 1.0 or 1.1 box, you'll need to put a 1 meg BIOS on the card. Now there are other ways around that and I'll get into that later when we talk about dashboards. but. Um, for all intents and purposes, if you've got a 1 meg BIOS, put a 1 meg BIOS on the card. If you've got a 256, put a 256K on the memory card. Um, so now you've telneted into the box. You're sitting there at a prompt. Um, well, I better give you the IP address that you need to telnet to. Uh, 192.168.0.64 is what it's going to be listening on. Um, when you telnet to that, um, it's just going to give you a little prompt. Um, I think it says X Linux or something like that. It's just it's just a little prompt. The um, you log in as root, which most of you probably won't be familiar with telnetting something that will allow you to log in as root, but that's the way they set it up. Uh, log in as root, passwords Xbox. Once you do that, it'll give you another prompt. Um, you need to change the directory to where the the um, file is, and I can get that information to you. It's a huge long string. Um, so I'm not going to bother talking about that right now. But you change to the directory where you have your game save hack and you have your BIOS. All right? And we use a program called Raincoat. And basically what Raincoat is, it's just a small Linux app that allows you to flash the BIOS. Um, you'll type Raincoat space, um, the name of the BIOS, and it'll flash the BIOS. Hopefully it'll say erasing and start running asterisks across showing you 10%, 20%, whatever. Um, and then it will say done erasing, and then it will say that it's flashing, and hopefully that process finishes. Because if it stops in the middle, your power goes out, your little brother kicks the power cord out of the wall or something like that, and it's not finished, you're probably screwed. Um, there are certain circumstances. If you have a 1 meg BIOS and it gets 25% of the way done, you're okay. There's a way to fix that, and I'm going to talk about that later. Um, if it's a 256K BIOS and it doesn't get 100% done, you're screwed. Um, so hopefully at this point you're sitting there at another prompt and it's told you that it's finished and it's done flashing your Xbox. At this point, go ahead and reboot the Xbox. You should now boot up with a different screen. Um, if the BIOS that you chose removed the Flubber screen or removed Microsoft from down at the bottom or changed the color of the Xbox logo on the screen, you should see that now. Um, if it starts flashing red and green, uh, you can definitely get it back with a mod chip. Uh, it's not a solder problem. Basically, you put the wrong BIOS on there. The BIOS was corrupt. You used a 256K BIOS on a 1 meg, and you didn't do it properly. But something went wrong during the flash. Um, I have seen this happen. Um, but again, you can put a mod chip in it and, and rescue it. Um, so if everything went well, you've booted up your Xbox, you've now got a, uh, a new BIOS on the Xbox, you're looking at a new logo. At this point, you will need to boot from, not that, your auto installer CD. When you boot from the auto installer CD, it's going to load up a new dashboard. It's not going to look like the old Xbox dashboard. 
It's going to have a lot more choices on it. Um, and I'll show you these here later on. But at this point, you want to make a backup of your Xbox. Okay? You can FTP into the Xbox at this point and save the contents of the C drive and the E drive. If you have any game saves on the Xbox or if you have any of your own music on the Xbox and you want to keep that information, you need to copy the E drive. Copying the contents of the C drive will help you get back to a retail state if you screw it up. Um, these hard drives are known as what's they're called they're locked and basically it's just a security feature that Microsoft's put on there to prevent you from taking this hard drive out of here and sticking it in your PC and reading it. Um, there's basically two things that are going to prevent you from doing that. One, it has a different file system. It's called FATX. A PC won't read that. But they have a security key on here that much ma much must match with the BIOS um, or it won't unlock. Now, there are ways around that. The auto installer can unlock the hard drive. Um, if you take a hard drive out of one Xbox and stick it in another Xbox, it's not going to work. It's not going to boot up because it doesn't have the same key and the EEPROM value is different, so you can't just swap hard drives from one Xbox to the other. Um, but the auto installer CD will allow you to unlock the hard drive. Once you've unlocked the hard drive and you've saved your data, and let me tell you this, you don't need to unlock your retail hard drive. Okay. If you don't plan on using it ever again, just toss it in the corner. Um, but if you want to use it in a PC, you want a 10 gig drive, you've got a use for it or whatever, you'll need to unlock it. And when you boot from the auto installer CD, that's a good time to do that. Um, so now we've got a backup of our Xbox. We have everything that's on C and everything we want to keep off of E. And we've got that on our computer stored safely if we need to go back to it again. Um, at this point, you can power down the Xbox, take out the retail drive, get your large hard drive. Hopefully, you've got something that's like 80 gigabytes or 120, or if you've got all kinds of money to throw around, you can put a 300 gig drive in it. Um, but basically, just a, a larger retail drive uh, would help out a lot. You can mod it with the factory drive in it. Um, again, it's only 10 gigs, so you're not going to be able to store a lot of information on there. Um, you can put that new drive in, again, boot off of the auto installer CD, and choose the options to prepare the drive. If the drive is larger than 137 gigabytes, you will need to have an additional partition. Um, for quite a while, nobody had a hard drive in their Xbox that was larger than 137, and everybody was telling us it's never going to happen. It's not possible. It's only going to accept 137 gigabytes. Well, somebody found out a way to do it in the BIOS, and now you can put whatever hard drive you want in there, as long as it's IDE. These things don't do SATA or anything like that. They're just regular IDE drives, um, 5,400 RPMs, anything like that will work. Um, put your new hard drive in, boot from the CD, prepare the drive, format the drive. It creates all your partitions. It will write basically a factory C partition in it that has the Xbox Live dashboard on it. Um, and there's also options on the auto installer CD for installing applications. Um, it comes with a lot of applications and it saves you a lot of time. Basically what I do is I prepare my drive, I install the dashboards and lots of applications. We'll talk about the different applications later. Um, that process will take probably about five minutes and once that's done you can power down the Xbox, put away your auto installer CD, and you are now done. You can put your Xbox back together. You have a now working modified Xbox. When you boot up the Xbox, it comes up to what's known as a dashboard. When it's on the dashboard, the FTP server for the Xbox is enabled. You can do DHCP with the Xbox, so if you have it on a network, it'll get an IP address, um, and you can FTP into it. That's how most people uh, manipulate files in Xbox is through FTP. Um, you can flash your BIOS, reflash your BIOS from the dashboard. Um, and there's lots of different applications that you can run. You can run Xbox games from the dashboard. You can uh, play DVDs if you have an application that doesn't require that little remote control. Um, you can actually use a controller to play DVDs. Um, 
Some of the other things that you can do with uh, applications, uh, everybody here knows what emulators are, right, as far as games go. Uh, a lot of you play the old school games like uh, Galaga, uh, Nintendo Entertainment System. The Xbox, pretty much there's an emulator out to emulate everything except for the PlayStation 2. I mean, they go way back, ColecoVision, Intellivision, Atari 2600, um, just about anything there's emulator software for. So if you can find the ROMs, um, you can play the games. Also, on a side note, if anybody would like to talk to me about ROMs afterwards, I'd be really interested in talking to people about ROMs. Um, not that I have any, because, again, I don't do illegal stuff, and playing those games is illegal. So, um, But I would be interested in talking to you about your ROMs. Um, backing up games. This is Microsoft's biggest problem with people modifying Xboxes. Earlier I said they don't make any money off these pieces of junk, um, and they don't. They made the Xbox. It's basically a loss leader. They say, okay, we're going to practically just give these things away, and we're going to make billions of dollars selling games. All right. Well, you know, they probably don't have a big problem with you modifying your Xbox and running Linux on it or Asterix or something that doesn't affect their profits, but um, backing up games is what they have a real big problem with. Um, they also have a real big problem with people playing modified Xboxes on Xbox Live and cheating. Um, more about that here in a little while. But you can back up games with modified Xbox. You can play burned on DVDs, you can play them that way. Or you can just stick the game into the Xbox, run an application, um, and copy the game right to the Xbox and you don't ever need to put the game back in. Um, you cannot play those games on Xbox Live. You must have the actual game in the DVD drive to play Xbox Live, but we're going to cover Xbox Live in its entirety here in just a little while. Um, so we talked about you can play emulators. You can back up games. Um, you can also play lots of different media files. There's a program called Xbox Media Center. Um, it will play practically any media, display any photo file, um, you can do streaming audio, streaming video. Um, you can stream from your computer to your Xbox and watch anything that's on your computer. Uh, it does shares. It does shoutcast. Um, pretty much any type of media you can imagine, Xbox Media Center does. Any type of codec that you can imagine, um, Xbox Media Center will do it. It has different things for, like, weather, where they basically went out and stole all the Weather Channel logos and created basically a Weather Channel that you can watch on your Xbox for your location, put in your zip code, it'll show your forecast. Um, that's Xbox Media Center. It's pretty much a must-have. Um, any If you get the uh, Slayers auto installer, it's going to install uh, at least Xbox Media Player or I think the new version does Xbox Media Center. Um, you'll definitely want to put that on there. Um, some of the other things you're going to want to put on there is an FTP client so that you can FTP from your Xbox to another Xbox. comes in handy if you say you want to trade some ROMs or uh, some games or something like that from one of your friends. You can just hook Xbox to Xbox with a crossover cable, and, and there you go. Um, so having an X, uh, Xbox FTP client is uh, a good thing to have. Uh, the dongle-free DVD player is another application that's uh, pretty good to have. Uh, as most of you know, Microsoft requires that you buy the little remote control, which comes in handy for other applications when you have a modified Xbox. It's kind of the only thing you can do with it if you have a retail Xbox is play DVDs. But um, it's kind of funny that people will modify their Xbox, use the game controller to play DVDs, but hack the controller that Microsoft sells to do other functions. Um, there are other applications out there, um, and you can rip DVDs. Um, I didn't get into a whole lot about what the hardware is, but it's a 733 megahertz mobile Intel Celeron. Um, it's not a real speedy machine. It's got six or 64 megabytes of DDR SD RAM. Um, don't use this thing to rip a lot of DVDs and start encoding DVDs and stuff like that because it's going to take you a long time. Most of you probably have computers that are a lot faster than this thing. But you can uh, rip DVDs with it. Um, 
the dashboard. Um, there's lots of different dashboards. Again, the dashboard is a screen that comes up when you boot up the Xbox. Um, it's the main screen. It's going to have your menu where you choose. Do you want to play a game? Do you want to copy a game? Do you want to delete a game? Do you want to watch a DVD? Um, you set the menus. You put the text in there, change the colors. You can have your own skins, different backgrounds. Um, the dashboard's got a lot of functionality in it. There are a lot of different manufacturers of dashboards. Well, not really manufacturers, but you know, different people have written different dashboards. Um, I use what's called Evox. It's a real popular uh, dashboard. There are some other ones, though, that have a lot of nice features. Avalanche is another dashboard that you'll see a lot of people talk about. It's got an IRC client in it, Telnet client in it, um, lots of other little functions. Um, it's pretty nice. You can also run dashboards as an application. So you can run Evox all the time, and if you want to, let's say, get on IRC, you can launch Avalanche as an app from inside of Evox. So that's pretty nice. Um, the actual programs themselves are pretty small as far as the amount of files that they have for the applications. Games have thousands of files. But as far as applications go, the Xbox looks for a file called default.xbe, or Xbox ex executable. Um, so you'll need to have the default.xbe in the path that you set up in the INI file of the dashboard, or when you click on the link, it's not going to find the program. Um, there's also a nice function in the dashboards where it's called auto add items. And with auto add items, basically you just put anything in that path and when it comes up, it looks in that folder and whatever it sees in that folder, it creates a menu item for. Um, that's, that's a nice function so you don't have to go in there constantly and change your INI file for your dashboard. Um, pretty much everything is done with an INI file and a default.xbe. So in the example of Xbox Media Center, if you're going to set it up to stream audio from your computer, you're basically going to need to tell it an address and a share name in the INI file. And then when you go to the menu in Xbox Media Center, it's going to find your share, connect to your computer. Um, you can set logins and passwords inside the INI files and stuff like that. Um, so it's really easy to figure out you know, how to install applications. There's not like a setup program that runs. You'd think there would be, but... Um, there's not, since it's not a Microsoft product, um, they don't throw lots of flashy screens on there when you're installing Xbox applications. You just FTP the folder to the machine, and that's it. And it just looks for that one file, default.xbe. Um, backing up games. Some games don't back up properly. You'll put the game in there, it'll copy, it'll say it copied, it'll show up in your list, and when you try to play it, it doesn't work, okay? Um, most of these require patches that you can get from the usual places, or um, there's a problem with the program that you use to copy it. You need to get an updated version. Uh, I remember when uh, the Matrix game came out, the program that they used to copy games did not handle file names that were longer than like 32 characters. And there was a file name in the Matrix CD that was longer than 32 characters, and it just ignored it. It didn't copy it from the DVD to the Xbox. So um, you had to get an updated version of the program that you're using to back up games. Um, DVD to Xbox, that's DVD, the number two Xbox, is a very popular program. Um, it also rips DVDs. So if you've got a video DVD that you want to rip, you can do it with that, or it will copy games. Um, and you can also delete games with it as well. Um, how are we doing on time? What time is it? Say again. Okay. Um, see, I talked about uh, streaming. If you want to stream, CC Extreme is a good program for streaming. There's lots of other programs out there for streaming. Everything that I've talked about, there's usually two or three programs. Now, keep in mind that all of these programs were written with a pirated version of the Microsoft Xbox Software Developers Kit. So you're not going to find these programs plastered all over websites. All right? uh, you're going to need to find things in the usual places, as they call it. Um, I'm going to give you some URLs to look at, um, places that you can go to find these things. Um, and then I'm going to give you some demonstrations uh, on my Xbox um, of different things in the menus and stuff like that. Um, the main place to look for information 
to find out tutorials, how-tos, forums is xbox-scene.org. Um, that is basically like the slash dot of Xboxes. Now, there are other sites out there, Xbox hackers. But basically, if it's on any of those other sites, it's already been on Xbox Scene. Um, great pictures section on there. Um, you can get how-tos that will describe everything that I described in great detail um, with nice pictures. And um, There's also f good forums on there that you can ask people. Um, you know, If you're getting this little thing that's popping up this weird message, you can ask in the forums, and somebody's probably already seen it. Um, if you want to get files, if you want to get any of the things that I've talked about, if you want to get the auto installer CD, if you want to get the 007 agent under fire exploit, um, if you want to get BIOSes, um, there's basically one place to look. Uh, you'll need to get on IRC, you'll need to be on FNET, and go to channel pound xbins, X-B-I-N-S. When you log into the channel, you message the bot, it'll come up with a, with a message when you log in if you want to get access to their FTP server. Uh, you have to message the bot. The bot will respond back with your temporary username and password. Um, your username will be the username that you are logged into the IRC server with. The password will be emulation. This is the password. That's good for one login. If you time out, if you log out, or whatever, lose your connection, you have to go back into the channel, message the bot. They'll set you up another, another login. Uh, you can get 30 files per day maximum. Um, but that is the place to get anything from. Um, if you want any BIOSes or any files at all, um, the it's uh, distributions. It's the FTP server is distributions.xbins.org is the FTP server. Um, and they've got everything on there from applications for your PC that will unlock hard drives, create BIOSes, change splash screens, make skins, to applications for the Xbox that I talked about, like Xbox Media Center, backup programs. Um, they've got it all there. It's, it's like a one-stop shop. You really don't need to look anywhere else. Um, that's about all the information that I'm going to cover right now. I'm going to hook up an Xbox, show you what uh, a dashboard looks like, show you what some of the different applications look like. Um, and I'll talk about some of the features of maneuvering around the Xbox, and then we'll take some questions, all right? Give me just a moment to hook up this Xbox. I'm going to run out for just a second. I actually forgot to bring something uh, with me. I'll be back in just a second. Before I do that, though, there's one thing that I, I didn't cover. I mean, basically because of time. Um, you know, somebody could stand up here for days and talk about all the things that you can do with the Xbox. Um, a lot of people are into case mods. Um, there's lots of different case mods out there, people with neon lights. I've seen some really nice Xboxes here. I've seen some pictures posted on the freaknick.info forum. Um, people got some nice Xbox mods. You can make the front LED around the power button flash different colors. Um, there's controller mods. Um, there's lots of different things that you can do with an Xbox. Um, I would have liked to have you know, incorporated a lot more than that, but basically uh, my goal was to just take somebody that has never modified an Xbox, go from beginning to end, so they can do a mod. If you can get the mod done, I mean, you can figure out case mods and blinking lights, stuff like that on your own. It's, it's pretty simple. 
But um, I'm going to go grab something that I forgot, and I'll be right back, and we'll hook this Xbox up. I forgot my dongle. Okay, I do apologize. I should have been prepared, but I forgot my dongle. So, um, Basically, here's what you're going to see when you boot up um, a modified Xbox. Now, it's probably not going to look exactly like this, but I changed the color of the Xbox logo. Um, it's an Executor 2 BIOS that's displayed from the BIOS. You can change that. You can make it say whatever you want or say nothing. Um, this is a dashboard right here. You're on the main screen of the dashboard. You can maneuver through the menu items. You can put whatever menu items you want. You can call them whatever you want. This is all done from the dashboard I and I. Mr. Green Giant, that's basically just what they call a skin. Um, you can take any picture file, make your own skins. You put pictures of you on there, your dog, your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever you want. Um, you can keep as many skins as you want on there, too. So you can have a different look every day or whatever you want to do. Um, 
Yeah, old school games. Wonder what those are. Um, DVD movie player, region free. I forgot to tell you about that. It's region free too, so that's that's another good feature. You know, all you guys that are in anime. Well, wait, they're not in here. They're over there, right? <laughs> they don't leave that room. All oh, freaknik. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Nothing against anime, right? <laughs> I don't have an actual DVD in here, but um, if I did, basically the menu would come up and I can maneuver through the DVD menu with the controller um, without having to have their little remote and little infrared thing that's plugged into the Xbox. Um, one thing that I want to tell you about is a feature that's called In-Game Reset, or you might see it referred to as IGR. Uh, In-game reset's a real nice feature because you don't have to get up off the couch and go reset the Xbox every time you want to switch from one game to the other. Um, I think that's one of the nicest features of having a modified Xbox. <laughs> um, before, you had to switch discs and, you know, you had to go up and reset it and everything like that. Um, not with a modified Xbox because you can do what's called in-game reset. Now, in-game reset has issues. Um, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it locks up the Xbox certain games it doesn't work in. Um, there's still bugs in it, but it works at least 90% of the time. So um, if I'm in this application here, I should be able to pull both triggers and the back and the start button to get back to the dashboard, or basically it just resets the Xbox. There are also modifications where you can put a switch on your controller. Uh, I think they even have switches that you can put in memory cards to reset the Xbox. But in-game reset usually works pretty good. We'll see if it works now. And we should, we should get back to the dashboard just like that. Um, some of the applications. Uh, first thing I want to show you is, is where you go in to manage the memory card. So when you're transferring the uh, game save hack from the memory card to the Xbox, you'll be familiar with this screen. The Microsoft dashboard is still on here. You still need it to do memory management. Um, you still need it to manage your music um, and any settings for the Xbox. If you have like HDTV or a different surround sound system, you can change those settings in here. Um, the Xbox, I didn't really get into much Xbox, Xbox versus PS2, um, but I will tell you that the Xbox does Dolby Digital 5.1 surround sound in games, not just on, um, what do they call those, cinematics or um, like splash screens and stuff like that. It does it at actual in-game. In, in uh, it also does high definition. Um, so that is two features right there that put it above the PlayStation 2. Um, I don't want to get in a big war. I like the Xbox. It's extremely modifiable. You can make it do a whole lot more than what it did when it came to you. It does Dolby 5.1 and HD, and I like those features, um, so that's why I choose Xbox. Um, but you will have the retail dashboard on here. Um, let's talk about Xbox Live. All right. Um, some of you may not want to use your Xbox on Xbox Live. Some of you may not even use it to play games. You might modify it to do asterisk or some other function, make it a web server. You can run OS 10 on it. You know, if any of you are, are Mac people, um, it takes about 12 hours to install. Um, and you have to emulate. Basically, you have to install Linux, compile Pair, and install OS 10. Um, so it's not going to be an extremely fast system. Um, but for bragging rights, you can say I have OS 10 on my Xbox. Um, you may want to just run Linux on it. Um, if any of you were here for Tom's talk last night, you know his thoughts on Gen 2. But Gen 2 is a very popular distribution for Xbox. Um, I don't really use Linux on the Xbox for anything other than Flash and BIOSes. But if that's your thing, you still need to go through the procedure of making the modification. Um, but you can do other methods like I talked about before with the, the uh, soft mods and stuff like that to get uh, Linux on there. Um, Xbox Live, Microsoft's gone through great measures to prevent people from getting onto Xbox Live with modified Xboxes. One of the main reasons is you can cheat, okay? Um, 
they get in these games, these car games, football games, and stuff like that, and they have a ranking system on Xbox, so you can say, you know, I'm the greatest player in the world. Um, and Xbox doesn't want people cheating when they're when they're on there. Um, just a couple days ago, now, earlier I told you that you can have a 1 meg BIOS or a 256K BIOS. If you have a version 1.0 or 1.1 Xbox, it comes with a 1 meg BIOS. Well, you only need 256K for a BIOS, so you have all this extra space left on this 1 meg chip. You used to be able to install a switch on the Xbox to two points on the motherboard, A18 and A19. If you hit the switch, you can put a retail BIOS on half of that 1 meg chip and a modified BIOS on the other half. So when the switch is on, modified Xbox. When the switch is off, retail Xbox. And you could get on Xbox Live that way. Um, as of the 21st, I heard that they have taken new measures, uh, new security measures with Xbox Live, that even if you have a switch, they will still ban your Xbox. They don't ban your account. You can still get on Xbox Live with a different Xbox, but they ban the Xbox itself. It used to be that if you forgot to hit the switch, that uh, your Xbox would get banned. You could take an EEPROM from another Xbox, transfer it over to this Xbox, and get back on Xbox Live. I don't think that's going to be the case now because from what I understand, switch or not, if it's modified, it's getting banned. Um, I can't verify this. Uh, I've seen it posted to one of the major sites. It was the Xbox scene. Um, pretty much what they post is, is pretty, pretty legit. Um, but again, I can't verify it. I don't play Xbox Live. Um, but if you do, you'll need to have another Xbox. As cheap as these things are, if Xbox Live is really your thing, you know, these games are like 50 bucks. It costs 50 bucks a year to uh, be on Xbox Live. You might as well put out the price of two games and a membership to just go buy an Xbox just for Xbox Live if that's your thing. Um, that out of the way, um, I've pretty much covered everything that I intended to cover. We have, I guess, about 10 or 15 minutes left for some questions and answers. Um, I'll go ahead, and there's another microphone out here. If anybody has any questions, if anybody wants to come up at this time to take a look at anything, feel free to. Um, and I'll get you some information that you can get in touch with me while I'm here at the con. I will be throwing the party that's in the anime room tonight at 10 o'clock. So if you want to do Xbox mods, I would recommend that you do it before 10 o'clock. Because <laughs> I'm going to be in there getting drunk. <laughs> and you don't want me modifying your Xbox when I've had too many to drink. Um, so I'm going to open the floor up to any questions. Anybody wants to come up here and see anything? If you want to play around with the Xbox, feel free to. Oh, but one more thing that I wanted to show you. Okay, I talked about the red and green light flashing, but you may get something else. And I've set my Xbox up here. Um, I'm going to hit the switch on here. I have uh, made changes to the dashboard on the retail BIOS portion of this so that it comes up to an error. It comes up with the, what they call this the flubber screen. It shows the Xbox logo, and it goes to this error message, okay? Um, I would recommend that you get on Xbox scene and do a search on there for Super Fro. Super Fro, that's the guy's name. He has made a list of all of these error codes and what they mean. Um, error code 5 means that the hard drive is unlocked. And earlier I told you if you have a hard drive that's retail, and in the retail BIOS, it must be locked. So if you want to play Xbox Live, you have to lock the hard drive. Or when you hit your switch, which you can't even do anymore, um, you'll get this message. This means unlocked hard drive. There's about 20 different messages. Um, if the dashboard's wrong, you can load a dashboard from the C partition, from the E partition, from the F partition, and that information comes from the BIOS. So if you load a BIOS that says, I'm looking for the, bi for the dashboard files on E, and you put your dashboard on C, you're going to get a message like 15 or 16. I can't remember which it is. But having those error codes will be an extreme help. So that's super fro. Get the list, print it out, keep it handy. Um, just so you can see, um, it's flashing red and green. That always means a problem.
uh, orange and green, I think it is. If you don't have the video cable in the back of it, it's going to flash orange and green. Um, I think there's four different modes to the colors on this. Somebody else that's into modifying may be able to correct me. But I think it does orange, yellow, green, and red. And um, there's lots of other light mods that you can do. Um, but that's the last thing that I want to tell you about was error codes. So now it's really up for questions and answers. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anything that a Xbox with a mod chip can do that an Xbox uh, modded the way that you've shown us can't? Not anything that's been brought to my attention. Um, other than maybe like a 1.6 Xbox, um, the 1.6 Xbox does not have a flashable BIOS. I don't know why it took Microsoft so long, seven versions, to put a chip on there that's not flashable. Okay. Um, but if, if that may be a case where you have to have a mod chip, there's no way to do a TSOP flash on it, so that method's not going to work. Your options are like a soft mod exploit or a mod chip. Now, the mod chips had a nice feature on them where they came with switches already. And you basically plugged the switch into the mod chip, ran the wire out the back, mounted the switch on it, so you could switch from a retail BIOS to non-retail BIOS. And some of them have even larger BIOSes, like a 2 meg and multiple switches, so you can preload several different BIOSes on there to do several different things, like a retail and maybe you want a, a blue X on one and a red X on the other or something like that. Or you might want to load one dashboard from a partition with this switch, but load a different BIOS and a different dashboard from a different partition with this switch. In that case, you'd want to have a mod chip. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, what about the limited edition Xbox they put out? Do you know what version that is, or is there anything different about it? Um, are you talking about the one with, like, the, uh, the clear Halo case one. or... The Halo one. Yeah, the Halo one. Don't know a lot about it. I know that there are differences for it. I've never had one in my hands or even seen one in person. Um, but there are differences with the Xbox. Um, it's not the same as a 1.0 through a 1.7. You can get those differences off of Xbox scene. I've seen them posted on there. Um, but that's about all the information that I've got. So you don't know what version they would be at all? I, I don't know what version it would be. Um, but there's a section on there that will tell you, you know, how do I tell which version that I have. There's also a way that you can do, like, a serial number lookup. It's not guaranteed. It's real, it's real iffy. But um, you can look at the serial number and kind of tell which version it is. And um, I do know that those right there, they have a, a, a distinct serial number that specifies that it's that Halo Xbox. Um, and I don't think that they were really released here in the United States as much as they were in, like, Europe and places like that. A lot of people over there have them. Um, they are modifiable, as far as I know. But uh, if you get on Xbox scene, you can find out what the differences are. Anybody else have any questions? Anybody want to come up here and take a look at any of this stuff? The mod chip that I brought with me, this is called a Matrix chip. It's a little older. Um... Mod chips they have where you don't have to solder them in. They have these things that are called pogo pins that just basically touch certain contacts on the board. Um, one disadvantage to these mod chips, um, he, I had a question earlier, you know, are there any advantages to a mod chip? Well, not a whole lot of advantage there, but there are some disadvantages. With these pogo pins, if you bump the Xbox around, it can lose contact on the points. And if you take a look at this chip, you'll see that these points are really small. Um, you have to get it lined up just per perfectly. You'll get a light on it, and then you tighten down the screw. If you transport your Xbox a lot, you may want to go with a mod chip that solders in because, you know, you drop your backpack or something like that, that mod chip could come loose. You have to take the whole Xbox apart, realign your mod chip, tighten it up. Um, so that's one thing to consider if you're going to go with mod chip. The pogo pins, it makes it easy to install but it also makes it to where you probably should just leave it on the TV or leave it in the entertainment center and don't touch it. Anybody else? Tom, you got a question back there? You're scratching your head? <laughs> All right, well, if anybody wanted to come, wants to come up here and take a look at any of this, uh, if you want to play around with the Xbox, if you got any questions that you didn't want to ask me, go ahead. Thanks. <laughs>